The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone, welcome to the STOA and the final session of our pseudo symposium of the day. Let us maybe make the meta crisis our superordinate goal symposium. Um, and uh, I was thinking of like having a, a session at the symposium on environmental and uh, the ec uh, ecological crisis, but uh, you know, some people couldn't make it that I invited and a lot of stuff just felt like corporate. Like, kind of like, I just didn't, wasn't vibing with that with it. And, uh, and then I was on Amazon and I saw a book, Bright Green Lies. It was from Derek Jensen, a book, new book coming up. I'm like, what? Um, and so the title of the book was Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It. And apparently the book was being released on March 16th, which was the same day as the symposium. And uh, Derek was a previous guest at the Stowe and that was a great session. So I decided to invite him back uh, with his co-authors for the book and they agreed. For the final session so this is sort of like a book launch party um last session of our symposium uh we're going to end a little bit early today but how it's going to work i'm going to introduce the um our guests in a moment and then uh, take them in they can share their thoughts on the book and then we'll pivot to the q a so if you have any questions anytime just put them in the chat i'll call you mute yourself if you ask your questions uh if you don't want to be on youtube just indicate that in the chat um so we have, like I mentioned, we have uh, Derek Jensen returning. Uh, Derek is author, uh, eco-philosopher, and radical environmentalist, according to Wikipedia, at least. Uh, uh, and Lear uh, Keith is a writer, radical feminist, food activist, and environmentalist. And we have Max Wilbert, an organizer, writer, and wilderness guide uh, here with us today. So I thought I'd take in Derek and then maybe just uh, can talk about the, the book, uh, summarize it, and then we can go from there. And welcome back to the Stoa. Let me just allow you to unmute yourself. Hold on one minute. There you go. Well, thank you for having me back. And um, so the book uh, really started 10 years ago when uh, I was asked to do a debate with somebody who came up with the term bright green and what bright greens are or they believe that the, um, the, that the current culture is, can be made to be sustainable through technological innovation. And some of their primary manifestations these days are among the uh, sort of climate activist movement where a lot of them are pushing for um, a lot of wind and solar and say that wind and solar will save the planet. And, the debate was kind of a disaster in great measure because uh, the other guy was just making stuff up. And at first I had insisted that we do it purely by, by, by writing because I knew this was gonna happen. And I didn't know, you know, in the moment if somebody makes some outlandish claim, you can't, if you're doing a, a verbal debate, a lot of times you can't respond because you don't know what claims they're gonna make. Uh, but if it's written, you can take the 15 minutes to, to do the research. It's so like he was claiming that uh, this culture could do away with mining altogether be, by having 100% recycling. And that after the debate, which we had on the phone, which never got published because it was so absurd, um, you know, it took me 15 minutes afterwards to, to do the research to find the ways that 100% recycling is not feasible. You can't have this culture without having mining. And so I thought this is really disturbing because they're, they're really running a lot of discourse and they've taken over the environmental movement. And I'll talk about that in a second. And so 10 years ago, I decided I wanted to write a book about it. And I was sort of plodding along doing some. And then uh, along came Max and Lear to my rescue and uh, frankly, they both wrote the best parts of the book. Um, I, I filled in. Um, anyway, um, the, the sort of one of the points of the book is that one of the things that's happened over the past 30 years, especially, is that the environmental movement has, it used to be about protecting wild places and wild beings. 
and it's been co-opted into attempting to sustain this culture. And, um, and that one example of that could be that you can have 100,000 people marching on the streets of New York or Washington DC or Paris. And if you ask them why they're marching, they'll say, We're, we wanna save the planet. And if you ask their demands, their demands would include subsidies for the wind and solar industries. And that's an extraordinarily extraordinary coup to be able to turn the environmental movement into a lobbying arm of industrial capitalism, sector of industrial capitalism. That's just, just outrageous and horrifying. And a lot of the primary proponents of climate activism and bright green stuff are quite explicit that what they're trying to save is this culture. They're not trying to save the planet. And this book, and then I'm gonna finish and toss it over to you. This book is fundamentally about how, A, the solutions they propose don't help the planet, and B, they wouldn't even power industrial civilization. So they are, um, they're basically, it's an opportunity to just create more energy for industrial use. We used to know in the environmental movement that the problem was we were taking entire living communities and turning them into dead commodities. And then that gets changed into private wealth. So you'll find some people on the left where the problem lies in the private wealth part of this, that it should be you know, more socialized and everybody should get a piece of this pie. And for us, the problem was always one step back. Why are we killing our planet? We only have one. We, we can't consume our planet and have it too. Like we're gonna have to pick one or the other. Um, and so what they've done is they've completely erased that part of the problem so that what they're trying to save is that level of consumption. Um, the only people who need industrial levels of energy are people who are doing industrial levels of consumption. No humans have ever had this before, nor have they ever needed it. No, but, the future. And they're not going to have it in the future because we've used it all. I mean, it was fossil fuel and it's we're on the downside of the curve now. Um, so all of this is an effort to continue that level of consumption. And they've changed the primary loyalty because, like Derek said, that used, this used to be about the places and the creatures that we loved and trying to save them from destruction. And instead, now the question is, well, how are we going to continue to consume them? Um, we've wrecked the climate burning fossil fuel. So if we could find some other energy source, we could continue on with this level of consumption, which is the destruction of the planet. Um, so this problem number one is that, I mean, the, the nature of the problem has been completely redefined such that the living planet is now invisible. So we say in the book, they're solving for the wrong variable. And then the second problem is of course, when you do the math on any of this, none of it works out. You, there's no way to scale up even if you're gonna accept the inherent destruction of things like wind and solar and biomass, which are just as horrible as fossil fuels. I mean, I'll put that in as an aside. We can talk about the details of it if you want, but um, in many ways they are worse than fossil fuels. But even if you're gonna set that aside, they don't scale up to actually power the, the level of energy that uh, this culture requires to keep moving. So it, it shouldn't be done, but also it can't be done. So we've really been just fed a pack of lies for the last 20 years. and it's um, it's very depressing. It was 20 years we didn't have. I mean, the planet's basically out of time. We're, we're up against the very edge now. So that's why we felt really compelled to write this book. Before Max jumps in, I wanna say one more thing. Thank you for that. Um, which is an example of how it's, it's not going to scale up is that uh, look around right now and ask yourself how many trucks, everything you see were on, how many semis and Diesel fuel has about 46 megajoules per kilogram, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly dense energy wise. And it uh, lead acid batteries store 0.17 megajoules per kilogram. And I don't know what uh, um, lithium ion batteries do, but the point is that you can have a 60,000 uh, 60, pound payload on a semi that has 600 pounds of of diesel, and I'm, I'm sorry, has however much diesel, 100 pounds of diesel, and it, however much diesel it has, and it can run 600 miles. But to carry the same payload, you would need 55,000 pounds of 
uh, batteries to go 600 miles. And for a 60,000 pound payload, that only leaves you with 5,000 pounds to carry stuff. So it's just diesel and gas are irreplaceable for this economy. No, we're not. I know we're going to get accused of shilling for the oil and gas industry. We're not. We're shilling for the planet. And what we're saying is that it doesn't even work on their own terms. Anyway, so Max. Yeah, I think the, the fundamental point that we're making in this book is really quite simple. You know, like Lear said, the, the movement, the culture in general is solving for the wrong variable. People have become so addicted to energy in our society that we've all lost track of the basis of life on this planet. You know, the ecology that we all rely on, that all life relies on, comes from clean air, comes from clean water, comes from intact ecological communities. And those communities are fracturing right now. They're fragmenting. Whether you look at, you know, phytoplankton populations who create two thirds of the oxygen that we breathe, they're in collapse. Songbird populations are in collapse. You know, the, this culture has changed the climate of the entire planet. And, you know, instead of actually addressing these problems, instead of taking the understanding of these issues as an opportunity to reflect on what are our values as a society, what's important to us, what really matters in the long term? Is it our cars? Is it gadgets? Is it the amount of money we've got in our bank accounts? Or is it, you know, our, the quality of our relationships, the quality of our lives? Is it, you know, how well we're able to relate to each other and to the places that we live? Uh, you know, we, the entire culture is losing an opportunity to change the course that we're on. You know, the, the, the growing understanding of the crisis that is global warming really provides us with an opportunity to step back and say, why are we living in this way? Why has our society been set up uh, in the way that it has? Why do we live in this society where just to exist, you know, you almost have to drive a car sometimes. You have to consume. You have to do things that are harmful to the planet. I mean, you know, look around you, the pen next to you, the computer that you're watching this on, all of these things are provided to us through these industrial production processes that, as we all know, they involve sweatshop labor, they involve highly destructive mining, they involve polluting, uh, polluting the soil, polluting the air, creating all these greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you know, even the simple thing like a pen only comes to us through a stream of atrocities around the planet. And if our movements aren't willing to, if our culture in general isn't willing to address that fundamental issue, then we're, we're in a big problem. We're in a, we're in a bad situation. And that's the problem with these bright green lies, as we talk about in this book. You know, the problem is not just that these things don't work. The problem is that they are serving as a distraction they're preventing people from grappling with the actual issues, right? It's like a filter between us and reality where people can just say, oh yeah, climate change is a major problem, but Elon Musk has got it all figured out. The technologists are gonna save us. Biden's gonna come up with the, the Green New Deal and you know everything's gonna be fine. Uh, that doesn't correspond to reality, right? That's a story that we're being told that has no real relationship to the actual reality on the planet. And so that's what we're trying to do with this book is, you know, point out these issues, which as I say, it's, they're not complicated issues. You know, the joke that I think Derek makes is, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that this culture operates by destroying the planet. In fact, it takes anyone but a rocket scientist to understand this. And, you know, we're just trying to point out this simple reality and you know, chart a different course. Because humans all over the world for thousands of years have lived in sustainable relationship with the planet. It's not like it's a mystery how to do that. It's not like it's some you know, crazy, absurd thing that nobody understands. We know how to live sustainably, right? Our ancestors did it for thousands upon thousands of years. Uh, the problem is that we're living in a society that's headed in the exact opposite direction. And if we can't face that truth, 
then we're just, you know, accelerating headlong into the apocalypse. And that's what we want to try and avoid, hopefully. And hopefully the book will, will help with that. To speak on the, the structure of the book, the, the 15 chapters. Uh, so you first you go through all the, the lies, the, the solar lie, the wind lie, the green city lie. And then on chapter uh, was it 15, uh, you talk about, or 14, uh, the real solutions. And I, I didn't read that chapter, but uh, I saw the line and industrial civilization. Uh, so maybe you can speak a little bit on um, the real solutions that you uh, present. Well, we, we, Yes, the, 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 the problem is that um, this is an inherently destructive way of living. And from the beginning, civilization has been based on uh, destroying land bases and converting those land bases into uh, humans and into artifacts. And um, I contrast that with, for example, the Talawa. And I'm not saying the Talawa were perfect. I mean, no culture is perfect. We're all have our issues, but the truth is we know they lived here for 12,500 years and the place was not trash. There were still, the Klamath River just south of here was still, it was late as the 1930s, black and roiling with fish, salmon. And- There are none now. Yeah, they, they've had to cancel their, their salmon festivals because they don't have the fish. And, um, and the population in this county, surprisingly enough, was about half of what it is now. I mean, there were, there were so many salmon here that the population was quite big, human population. And so we have, an, an, a, you know, the first written myth, one of the jokes I tell, which is not very funny, is they say that one sign of sentience is the ability to recognize patterns. And I'm gonna lay out a pattern, let's see if we can recognize it in less than 6,000 years. And that's when you, when you think about Iraq is the first thing you think of, cedar forest, so thick that sunlight never touches the ground. That's what it was. The first written myth of Western civilization is Gilgamesh deforesting the hills and valleys of Iraq to make a great city. And that's the whole story right there. Uh, the Arabian Peninsula was Oak Savannah. The Near East was heavily forested. North Africa, those forests went down to um, make the Egyptian and Phoenician navies. Um, ancient Greeks, uh, Plato, Socrates, and who's the other Aristotle. one? Aristotle all complained that logging was harming water quality. And I'm reasonably certain that the ancient Greek Department of Environmental Quality uh, said we need to study this for a few years and make sure there's a correlation. Anyway, the point is, that's a pattern. Why are there no penguins in the Northern Hemisphere? There's no penguins in the Northern Hemisphere because they were called great ox. And there were so many that on one island, uh, they, they thought they could load every ship in France and they did and they wiped them out in the 19th century. This culture has been based on destroying land bases from the beginning. So on the biggest level, it is, um, it is inherently destructive. And I'm gonna tell one story and then I'm gonna go to you for solutions, like okay. things we can do in the meantime, if that's okay. Um, and the story is I was getting interviewed a few years ago. I love this story. This guy was a dedicated Marxist who believed that it was possible to have an industrial society with purely voluntary exchanges. And I said, okay, great. Um, do you have people living in cities? And he said, yes. I said, how do they get around? He said, buses. I said, great, what's your bus made of? He said, metal. I said, great, where do you get the metal? He said, mines. I said, great, how do you get people to work in mines? And he said, well, you pay them a lot. I said, well, you know, mining is so, it's such a horrific existence that it's one of the first forms of, of human slavery, but I'll give it to you. What do you do with the fact that every single hard rock mine in history has polluted groundwater? He said, um, I don't know. I said, so what do you do with the people who live next to the river that is now polluted by the mine? He said, well, you pay them to move. I said, what if they won't move? He said, we well, pay them more. I said, what if they have lived there for 5,000 years and their ancestors are buried there and they won't leave? He said, how many of them are there? I said, I don't know, 500. He said, well, the million people in the city vote and they vote that the 500 people living next to the river have to leave for the common good and then you kick them off. I said, so what you're telling me is you move from purely voluntary exchanges within less than two minutes, you move from there to democratic empire, land theft from indigenous people and genocide. Also, you can have a bus. 
And the point is that these, these technologies require certain social structures and they require materials, as you say, solar photovoltaics don't grow on the solar photovoltaic tree. They come from somewhere and that was someone else's land and they have to be removed so you can take it. So that is, again, the story of history. We can talk more about it if you want. Um, that's the framework that we're working in. And then, but even given this framework, there are still things we can do in the meantime. We're not, we're not saying just sit on your hands until civilization collapses. More, what is civilization? And to us, that's the problem. That's the root of the problem. So civilization just means people living in cities. That's what the word itself means. But what that actually means is that those people need more than their land can give. So the food, the water, the energy all have to come from somewhere else. And from that point forward, it doesn't matter what lovely, beautiful, nonviolent values people might hold in their hearts, that society is now dependent on imperialism and genocide because no one willingly gives up their land, their water, their trees. But since the city has used up its own, they have to go out and get those from somewhere else. And that is the last 10,000 years in a few sentences. That is the pattern of civilization everywhere. You have this bloated power center at the middle and it's surrounded by conquered colonies. And so one of the things that they have to go out and take is of course, human beings as labor, because it, it, this requires a huge amount of labor, amount of energy. And until very recently, that was all provided by either draft animals or humans or both. So that also requires a military. Um, you're gonna have an entire class of people whose job is war, whose job is to go out and get that stuff, including other people and bring it back into the power center. And then eventually the whole thing collapses. And the reason it collapses is because it's based on one single human activity and that's agriculture. So you have to understand what agriculture is and that's you take a piece of land and you clear every living thing off it. And I mean down to the bacteria and then you plant it to human use. So it's biotic cleansing. We've all heard of um, you know, other, other kind of ethnic cleansing uh, but this is every living thing. It's not just the people. And you do that over and over again, you degrade the soil. So civilizations last anywhere from 800 to maybe 2000 years and they last until the soil gives out and that's the exact length of time. So every last one of those kind of city, city states uh, civilizations, they all collapse because the topsoil is gone. And then the cities, they could only get so big because they didn't have fossil fuel yet. So there was kind of a, a scale that they couldn't break. Um, because they couldn't get supplies back and forth. They couldn't get military orders back and forth. There was only so much stuff you could bring in from far away. So the ones that were based on like um, ocean routes and like around the Mediterranean could get a little bit bigger because they could use the waterways. But the ones that were more land-based, so it's just, it was only gonna go so far. Like Rome couldn't get past the Alps. So most of Northern Europe was pretty safe from the Roman empire. Um, so just one example, but they all collapse. And that's why is because every time you do that activity, you're destroying the soil a little bit more. So then you have to take more land. Um, and that's what we've done. So by 1950, the world was out of topsoil. And there should have been at that point that that collapse, that inevitable collapse, there've been 34 civilizations, they have all ended in collapse. And this one's not going to be any different. But what happened in 1950 was they had figured out already how to use oil and gas. Um, to for fertilizer. And so that was done for the war effort because that's what bombs are made out of is nitrogen. And then the scientists for almost hundred years at that point already knew that the world was running out of nitrogen, that the soil was giving out everywhere and nobody knew how to fix it. So when they figured out the Haber-Bosch process, which is how you get usable nitrogen out of oil and gas, it's very energy intensive, but it can be done. Then the scientists said, oh, great, we've got a solution. We can keep feeding these billions of people. Um, and that was this thing called the Green Revolution. So what we've been eating ever since is oil on a stalk. And there's not a single human being alive who does not have um, proteins from oil in their bodies, like it's in our tissues, because that's what we've been eating ever since. So this is going to end in a really ugly way. I mean, there's not really any way around that. We've just made the problem four times worse, because after the Green Revolution, the human population quadrupled. So we didn't solve the problem, we just extended it and in fact, quadrupled it. So here we are. Um, so two of the, the main solutions that we talk about in the book, and we certainly aren't the people who made this up, but the, the two biggest things we can do are we need to repair. So 
the ways to do that are we have to start withdrawing human activities from the destructive human activities anyway from um, what's left of the wild and then let let the planet repair and the, the, planet, can do it. the planet absolutely can do it as long as it's, not push too far as long as we stop uh, we can't bring back species that are extinct but you give it just a tiniest bit of room and, and life wants to live so it comes back and we've seen that with rivers that have had dams removed um, i've seen it god knows and agricultural plot after agricultural plot, when they stop plowing, life comes back. Um, we can help it. And one of the best ways we can do that is to repair the trashed out grasslands. Um, there's 98% of the world's old growth forests and 99% of the world's grasslands have been destroyed and they've been destroyed for agriculture. So if we were to let the grasses come back um, with the cohort of ruminants that they need because those species work together to create what are grasslands. Um, within 15 years, we could sequester easily uh, most of the, the carbon that's been released since the beginning of the industrial age. So that's the project, we have to do that. And then the other thing is of course, um, human consumption has to drop. And with that as well is related to that is human population. And a lot of people get very anxious talking about human population because of the ways that 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 has been used, especially against poor people and people of color. And I'm not coming at it from that angle in any way. This is not a subject we need to be afraid of. As it turns out, the number one action that you can take to drop the birth rate anywhere is really simple. You teach a girl to read, which is to say that when women and girls have even the tiniest amount of power over their lives, they will naturally choose to have fewer children. So all these children being born are, is really against the will of women. Um, every year, half the children that are born are either unplanned or unwanted. So all we have to do is give women full access to health care and some degree of liberty, and this problem solves itself. Um, there's already about 40 countries that have negative or stable population growth, and that's really how you do it, is you just empower women and girls. So this problem was never people versus the planet, and I know a lot of times it gets set up that way, kind of in the popular story, but it's not. It's people plus the planet because the only way we're gonna solve it is to give everybody full human rights and especially women and girls. So those are our main solutions. Um, Max probably has some things to add. Yeah, that was really well said. I would just add that, you know, Lear talked about the Haber-Bosch Haber process of how, you know, mostly natural gas nowadays is converted into nitrogen fertilizers for agriculture. And, you know, it's to the point now where the average human being on this planet, about 50% of the nitrogen in your body is fossil fuels. It comes from fossil fuels. So, I mean, this is not a, a figurative transformation. Our, you know, the reason that we have nearly 8 billion people on the planet is because the, the actual mass of fossil fuels has been transformed into human beings, into human biomass. And the same could be said of uh, of forests, of grasslands, of soils, of uh, wild creatures on this planet. You know, for example, over the last, uh, I think, century or so, uh, let's see, here's the quote actually from the book. In 2017, a report was published showing that deforestation, agriculture, and other quote unquote land use changes has reduced the global biomass of plants by more than 50%. Uh, that biomass isn't going, it's not just disappearing. You know, it's, it's being turned into carbon dioxide and going into the atmosphere and warming our planet. And it's being turned into commodities and into human beings, right? So when we say that this culture is consuming or devouring or eating the planet, uh, that's not a, a figurative or metaphorical statement. It's quite literal, right? Um, you know, there's the meme that some people have probably seen from this old French guy who said uh, over 150 years ago, uh, forests precede civilizations and deserts dog our heels. And the image that goes along with that is, you know, a forest on one side and, you know, somebody unrolling a carpet, but what they're unrolling is actually a city on top of it, right? Um, this is how this culture has, quote unquote, advanced or progressed. Uh, and this is why, you know, people who've been critical of this process have resisted it throughout. You know, uh, one of the best authors I've ever read, Linda Hogan, a Chickasaw writer, she said, you know, progress is like a god to people. 
ordinary people will commit extraordinary atrocities because of progress. And that's something that we're seeing with these bright green lies is the uh, justification of atrocities. You know, I've spent quite a lot of the last two months in northern Nevada in a place where there is a proposed uh, lithium mine, an open pit lithium mine at this place called Thacker Pass. And it's being built to serve the electric vehicle industry and the energy storage industry. There's this huge and booming demand for electric car batteries and for grid energy storage, because if the sun isn't shining, if the wind isn't blowing, you need some way to get your power. And so you need giant batteries to store the power from this new green grid that, uh, that so many people are trying to build. Uh, that requires lithium and lithium mining is, you know, it's an atrocity. It's, uh, it's destroying the land, it's destroying the water, everywhere it's taking place. We tell stories in the book of, uh, you know, rivers full of dead fish in Tibet, of uh, indigenous communities completely displaced and dispossessed as their water supplies are completely drained out from underneath them in uh, Argentina and Bolivia and Chile. Um, and this place, Thacker Pass, is the proposed site of a new lithium mine, the first uh, major lithium mine uh, to be permanent in the U.S. in a long time. And, you know, people are saying this is a green mine. They're saying that uh, bulldozing uh, about 5,600 acres, that's several square miles of old growth sagebrush habitat for, you know, the greater sage grouse whose populations are collapsing. Uh, pronghorn antelope are only antelope species on this continent whose populations are at a fraction of their historic levels. Uh, you know, this project would suck out over a billion gallons of water uh, every year. And people are saying this is a green mine. So that mythology of progress really allows uh, the, the justification of atrocities. Um, but I know we were asked about solutions. Uh, so to get back to that, Peter, um, I think it really is true that in so many cases, the, the most important solution, the number one solution is to stop the destruction because the natural world can do a better job of healing itself than we could ever do. Uh, you know, you see that anytime that humans intervene in nature, you know, sometimes we can help out and sometimes we can do significant help, but the work is actually done by the bacteria, by the grasses, by the trees, by the plants, by the other beings who live here. That's what nature does. You know, nature has been recovering from asteroid strikes and lava flows and earthquakes and landslides for millions of years, it knows how to heal itself. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not very different to heal from industrial civilization. And so the first and most important thing we can do is stop the destruction. You know, the, the analogy we use sometimes is, you know, let's say that you've got a, a patient in the emergency room and they're bleeding out. They've got all these wounds all over their body. There's blood squirting everywhere but the killer is still standing there right next to them, stabbing them over and over again. And people are trying to bandage up this person and nobody's stopping the murderer, right? Nobody's stopping the attacker. Uh, we need to stop the destruction as a first priority and then the healing process can begin. But if we don't address that, uh, that destruction, then you know, we're ultimately just sort of delaying the inevitable uh, because without, you know, we're headed in the wrong direction. Um, all the indicators are getting worse. All right, so start putting your questions in the chat. We might only have time for one or two, but um, I'll take an Andre, because uh, he has a kind of a techno-optimist solution that has been going around even at the STOA here. So Andre, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I've been, taking, I've been listening to all the talks today and something I kept coming up in almost almost all of the talks was this idea that humanity should try to spread into uh, space in order to safeguard against uh, uh, extinction or to kind of get out of this problem that we're in. Uh, I obviously have my own thoughts about that, but I was wondering, you know, what, what are your general reactions to these um, techno, I call them techno optimist kind of uh, solutions that uh, to a problem that we have right here in our planet. Okay. Um, 
Well, I, I, I promised myself I was not going to use the word insane. Um, but I guess I lied to myself um, because that's crazy. And it's crazy for a bunch of reasons. One of them is that, um, I mean, what, what that's, if they, if they, like I just saw this thing a couple of days ago, they want to put a sperm bank on the moon um, in case the earth is wiped out. And, um, okay, first off, you're acknowledging that you're killing this planet and you're, you're putting the, the, the hope for survival on going somewhere else. And that, uh, you know, maybe, I mean, that's like burning down your house and you're still throwing gasoline on your house to burn it down and thinking about moving into a prison because I mean, living on Mars or the moon, you would be living in a prison. It's, it's this is not, you there's, can't walk outside. There's no atmosphere. And there's no water. There's nothing. You'd have to bring it all with you. And that's the first thing. The second thing is, do they not understand gravity wells? That um, there would be, I, I've actually seen people say, we need to leave the earth so that the earth can recover. It's like, it is so expensive to send anything to outer space that, I mean, it's, it's, we're, we're in a huge deep gravity well that you have to get out of that it costs, you know, I don't know how many joules, how many, how much energy to send one person out. You're not going to send 8, 8 billion people out. It's, 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 and where are you going to get the minerals to? It, it's, well, the spaceships. Well, now they're saying they're going to mine asteroids. And but how do they even do that? Like it takes so much energy just to get there and rope one in and bring it back. And the, it would be more than it was worth to do it. And I mean, what that says to me is the, okay, people, here's the problem or one of the problems is that people can more easily, what's the word, conceptualize the, the end of life on this planet than they can the end of this culture. Their primary loyalty is to this way of life so much that that they can blithely talk about. I mean, their stolid scientists are talking about the oceans could be devoid of fish by 2050. And that's easier to, to talk about and to imagine than it is to imagine the end of this culture. When I talk about this culture ending, people will say, oh, you want humans to end? No, no, actually I don't. Everything in my work is based on, I can sum it up in one sentence with a semicolon, which is, this way of living will not last. I guess I don't even need a semicolon. And when it's over, I would prefer that there is more of the world left rather than less. And so my response to the people who, first off, is not techno-optimist to think that we have to leave the planet in order to survive. That's as pessimistic as you can get because I actually love this planet. And, um, and also it's just, it's not, really feasible. It's just, it's a tremendous use of energy that, and by the way, that's not me breathing heavy. That's, that's the, dog. the dog. I mean, I'm excited to be here, but not that excited. <laughs> anyway, um, the, uh, uh, anyway, um, that's, It, it won't work. It's like the bright green stuff. It won't work. And it, I wouldn't want it to work anyway. So somebody else can answer that better than I can. Can you or Max answer that better? I feel like I just rambled. Uh, well, you make me think of, so you guys were talking about solutions. I'm going to check out your book, by the way. I'm interested. Um, I'm a big proponent of uh, permaculture in my community. I'm wondering uh, if you've read Bill Mollison's work or, uh, you know, the read about the permaculture movement in agriculture, uh, probably, um, if, if that is a viable solution to break into smaller communities that practice permaculture, so local agricultural communities. And somebody else, Chris D, I think, asked the same question earlier. 
Max, do you want to talk about that? Or you want me to talk about it? You want me to talk about it? Yeah, I mean, I was into permaculture, I'm like really into the 80s and the 90s more. And I got, I just got a little bit, um, I don't know, I, I got sort of cynical about it because it changed a lot during that, that time period that I think the original vision that they had was right on because they understood that the number one command was to build soil and that the only way to do that was print animals integrated into perennial polycultures. And it completely changed in the time that I was involved in it all. Um, a lot of people took over who didn't understand how soil is built and they, they lost sight of the fact that that was the number one thing that we had to do. And there were all these bizarre fights about veganism and, and then a lot of them ended up being so very against political organizing that it became this sort of personal solution that you could have your perfect little permaculture kind of set up in your backyard or maybe even your neighborhood. Um, and that that was what was required and, and nothing else was asked of us in order to save the planet. And, and my point was always, you know, we could have the most wonderful self-sustaining closed loop system, you know, right here on my 20 acres and it would be a beautiful way to live. But when global warming comes, it's coming from my land too. And more than that, when um, they decide they want the trees or the minerals that are under the ground, they're coming for it. That our beautiful little self-sufficient ways of life are just gonna be the after dinner snack for civilization because that's what's happened everywhere. The dominant culture bumps up against the most wonderful, peaceful, sustainable people that have ever existed and wipes them out. So unless we address the political nature of this problem, we're, we're not getting anywhere. Um, I think that those are great solutions to have in our back pocket because people are going to learn, they're going to have to learn where their food comes from and some ways, you know, to try to figure out how to do that where they live. So I'm still all for it in that sense, but it, the ways that they kind of split themselves off from political activism and political analysis, um, just, it sort of ended up being just a fantasy where I, what good will it do? I mean, the, the climate is warming, like, unless we stop this destruction, it, it doesn't matter what beautiful little things we build for ourselves. It's it's just as over as if we didn't. Um, so there's a sort of a larger analysis that I felt like a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them um, very consciously, they didn't want to engage in, in the kind of political realm. And I did try, I went to some of the regional gatherings where I lived and I really, you know, there were a lot of teachers there, a lot of the big people were there and nobody wanted to hear it. And then on the sly, I would always, every time, there'd be like five people who would come up to me like, thank God you said that. It's like, I've been trying for 20 years. I'm like, well, we can only do our best. So I think a lot of the techniques are really fun. And um, I do get a lot of inspiration from you know trying to figure that stuff out myself. I've had chickens, I've had goats, I've done all that. I had great Pyrenees dogs. Um, my house is passive solar. Like I enjoy all those things. Um, they make me feel really happy, but I don't pretend that they are more than they are because until we fix these absolutely global systems of destruction, it, it's kind of a pointless endeavor. Which doesn't alter the fact, I agree with you 100%, and that doesn't alter the fact that relocalizing food systems is, is one part. It's dreadfully important. Absolutely crucial yeah, it's part absolutely of the, crucial. the solution. The solution, uh, it's a solution. It's a part of the solution. I don't know what now it is. <laughs> yeah, I've been it. arguing. I've been going to a few permaculture events the last few years and basically trying to argue that, you know, if you take the, uh, the, the basic principles of permaculture seriously, then you have to be a revolutionary. I mean, it's a, it's a political project, ultimately. It's not. People have taken it to be this little backyard gardening thing. I'm going to create my little lifeboat bubble. I'm going to have my great farm. Um, but you know, if you take the actual considerations seriously, uh, then it, it's a revolutionary idea. Uh, and I think there is that potential there, but it has gone so much into this lifestyleism, and I just want to have a great life and I want to eat really nice food every day and so on, uh, which there's nothing wrong with great food, right? There's nothing wrong, wrong with a great life, except that we're living in this time of crisis. And if our you know, if our time isn't being mobilized, you know, at least to a significant extent towards stopping the destruction, then we're in serious trouble, you know. So the argument that I've been making at these permaculture gatherings is that we need to 
think of permaculture to, to steal the air's term uh, as a combat discipline, right? You know, if, if we are in this crisis era, then, you know, and we recognize that, you know, here in the US, both the Democrat and Republican parties are, you know, beyond derelict at, at, at the helm, they are, you know, actively steering the culture into a worse and worse apocalyptic future, then we need, you know, we need permaculture parties emerging at the grassroots level that are trying to take the governmental resources and structures that do exist and redirect all that energy towards sort of crash relocalization, you know, actively opposed to the industrial death machine, you know, actively shifting resources away from military industrial complex and, and you know, all these industrial dead ends into uh, sort of a political permaculture project. Um, you know, I would love to see that kind of thing. It's totally, totally technically possible. There's, there's no real barriers to that aside from the fact that the culture uh, doesn't seem to want that. And the media is obviously, you know, trying to teach everyone buy, 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 consume, 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 you know, video games, futurism, uh, Elon Musk is the Messiah and so on. Uh, you know, so that prevents some, uh, presents some significant barriers, but I'd really love to see the, the, the permaculture movement sort of get a revolutionary edge to it and take seriously the idea that it can't just be a subculture. It can't just be this thing that exists on the fringes. If it's going to actually be successful in any way, it needs to help transform the entire society, the entire economy, uh, the entire food system. Um, that, that we live in. So um, there's about five minutes left until uh, you have to leave. Uh, do you want to sneak in another question or do you want to uh, end here? What do you, what do you oh, think? I have a question, except I want to say one more thing, which is my experience too, is I've talked to, I've had some exchanges with some of the sort of, I don't know, what do you call them? The founders? Yeah, or Dave the, Green and Toby Hemingway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's very interesting. My experience of talking with some of the big wigs or whatever you want to call them, the theorists of permaculture um, has been that we're very much in line and they would completely agree with all this analysis. And the problem, and this happens with Christians and Buddhists and everything else too, is the second generation. You know, the people who sort of take it on, um, a lot of them have, I mean, it's that line about the Buddha's always killed on the road that that um, they came up with these ideas and they're really, really good. And, and they, they perceived it from the beginning as a revolutionary movement and recognized that you can't do it in isolation from changing everything. And then that has been diluted into basically a fancy form of gardening. And that's what's not helpful is that conversion of a revolutionary movement into, into gardening, will save, gardening by itself will save the planet. Right, uh, Reed, uh, I'll take you in for the last question. Thanks. Um, this kind of goes in line with the uh, revolutionary kind of idea. So I was curious if we put like a primate psychology lens on this. Um, I'll just read my question. Um, how do you make degrowth prestigious for primates who seek status and a means to signal it? Um, seems like a lot of the, uh, I hear a lot of integrity in what you're saying. And it'd be lovely if we could just somehow export that. Um, but in light of that, it seems like we need to incentivize primate behavior to try and allow them to come in. And if they were able to signal that they were in, that would have uh, kind of create a market for prestige to kind of draw people in. I don't know if you've thought about uh, any kind of maybe marketing ploy for our primate brains to get people in line with this. Okay, so do you know about uh, Ruth Benedict's good culture, bad culture stuff? No. Oh. Okay, it's great. Okay, Ruth Benedict wanted to know why some cultures are- She was a student of Margaret Mead's. And she was also worked with Abraham, or Abraham Maslow well, was, was her, her student. student right. Yeah, um, anthropologist. And she wanted to figure out why some cultures were good cultures and some cultures were basically bad cultures. And everybody knew what she meant. Like that some are cultures you'd really enjoy living in and others were just a nightmare of hierarchy and torture. Yeah. Why? And, and so <laughs> some of them would treat women and children well, some of them would treat them very poorly. Some of them have a lot of war. Some of them, people are just generally happier. 
and she she examined what is it is it is it race is it richness or poorness is it I always thought patriarchy was root of all evil, but it's not. It's like the root of half of all evil or something. Um, because it's not even patrilinear or matrilineal. It's the good cultures figured out that humans are social creatures. Okay, so here's the thing, is that some people like to argue that we are fundamentally altruistic and social and everything. And then the selfish gene people like to argue we're really selfish. Well, the truth is both, and we are both selfish and social. And the good cultures figured out how to make it so the most selfish thing you can do is behavior that benefits the society as a whole. And they will disreward or disallow behavior that benefits the individual at the expense of the group. And this isn't really some sort of cosmic weird thing. This is how healthy functioning families work. You know, if you get you get props for for passing the potatoes. You get props for doing a good thing. And what she found is that you can reward behavior that benefits the group. So let's say that we're all living here 300 years ago and I go catch a bunch of salmon and then I don't give it to anybody, but I try to sell it. Everybody's gonna hate me. They're gonna, they're gonna in some cultures, they would put a shaming pole outside your home that says, I'm a jerk. In other cultures, they would laugh at you like a hyena if you didn't share. And if you, on the other hand, share, it's like, wow, that's really great. I really like that person. And the reason that I can share all my salmon today is because I know tomorrow you're gonna go gathering huckleberries and you're gonna share all those. Like right now I could give all my money to a homeless person. How am I gonna pay the rent next month? It only works if there aren't any cheaters. So you have the entire society based on the building of social capital, interrupt anytime you want building of social capital rather than capital. And what they found, what Ruth Benedict found is all comes down to how culture handles wealth. That if it handles through what she called a siphon system, whereby wealth is constantly siphoned from rich to poor, then the everybody's gonna be fairly secure because you know your basic needs are gonna get taken care of and you don't have to fight. On the other hand, if it's handled through what she called a funnel system, where it's competition, where, and we're not saying anything about sports because humans have sports, non-humans have sports. I'm not talking about competitions play, but I'm talking about competition for real, like for resources. Then if you have that level of competition, you have a funnel system where it's constantly funneled from poor to rich, everybody's gonna try to be in that position. And so, yes, there are social rewards. We are social creatures and we need to reward behavior that's beneficially, that's socially beneficial and ecologically beneficial, as opposed to socially rewarding the people who by by wealth the people who are able to gather and uh hoard and use this to i mean look she just mentioned 20 acres now if she were going to be a timber person she could cut this land she could cut all the trees down and then she could use that money to buy more land cut those trees down use that money to buy more land and keep doing that ad infinitum until she's Weyerhaeuser. And never mind the fact that Weyerhaeuser got us land illegally from the public domain. Um, that's how the social reward system of this culture works is that those who can take win. And, and they get the highest status. And they get the highest status as opposed to going, oh my God, that person's rich, what a scum. What a total sociopath. We need to kick them out now. And in fact, maybe we need to push them off the ice floe when nobody's looking. Yes, which is, which is what some cultures would do. Anybody, I mean, we can talk about the sacred relationship that the Plains Indians had with the Buffalo, but it wasn't just a sacred relationship. It was also, they had rules where if somebody kills Buffalo, like if you kill a female Buffalo in the spring when she has calves, <coughs> They would, well, A, you wouldn't do it because it's disallowed. But if you did do it, they would destroy everything you knew you had and kick you out. And you basically, you're banished. That's that there were very serious consequences for violating those social taboos um, or social rules. Uh, we have like one minute. So somebody <laughs> else say something better than I just did on that. Reed, does that answer your question at all? Yeah, it, it sort of does. I guess I'm, I'm really curious about the signaling effect because I, I imagine like a young primate being born into the world right now. And on one hand, they have advertisements bombarding them on screens with things that look prestigious. 
and uh, look high status to them? And how are we going to signal our prestige economy for our own, what we hold sacred? That's kind of the signaling. You know about the baboon, the river troop and the forest troop? So yeah, let's end on that. We have to go with them. We got to go. But um, so baboons, for years, I mean, decades, were considered like the worst primates. They were patriarchal. They were violent. They were absolutely just atrociously behaved in their small groups. And everybody just assumed, well, that's natural. That's just how baboons are. And then there was one troop of baboons where, and of course, all the high-status males got all the food first. So somebody had put out this poison to try to kill. I think it was hyenas instead. And what happened was the baboon troop got there first. And so all the high-status males died because they ate the poisoned meat and nobody else got any because they were so selfish, which of course was the entire problem. So the top, I think it was like 25% of males just died overnight. And it was fascinating. You can read all about this. There've been so many articles. It was like, even in the New York Times, um, this is maybe 20 years ago. River Troop and Forest Troop. River Troop and Forest Troop, just look that up, you'll find it. Um, they completely retooled their culture. And the females and the nice males got together and said, we're not doing this anymore. So food, from that point forward, food was shared with everybody. Nobody was ever hungry. There was plenty of grooming behavior. Everybody petted everybody. And when a new male tried to join, if he behaved in the bad ways, they would immediately just forcibly stop him and then just keep socializing him until he uh, behaved well and was kind to everybody and shared and you know didn't hurt anybody and didn't try to kill the babies and do all these like totally sociopathic things. And so they did it. And this was this huge thing for anthropologists because nobody thought it could be done. And there, right before their eyes, they saw it happen, that they completely re-socialized and, and we made their culture to be something that was really pleasant and nice and happy. So we can do it. I don't know how, but it could be done. So, all right, we gotta go. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hey, really thanks, good Derek. Good job. Thanks, Peter. Right. Thanks, everyone. See you, Max. See you, Derek. See you there. Um, so while they slip out, I'll make some closing announcements. Uh, yes, so that was a full day of the Metacrisis uh, Symposium. Uh, I'm kind of zoomed out right now. So I'm going to take a, a, a nap. But thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, Evan, uh, for hosting those three events that we just had. Um, if you are new here at the store, we have a bunch of uh, events. We're not too much lined up, but we, you can go to the website, thestoa.ca. Uh, the next one is tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I think a Swedish philosopher is coming in to talk about the meaning of being a man. So uh, you can check that out, RCP on the website. That being said, everyone, thank you for coming to Stoa today.